Hi folks, I'm Dan Dworkis and this is the Emergency Mind Podcast, a space where we bring together lessons from the emergency department and beyond about performance when it matters the most and applying knowledge under pressure. I'm really excited today to bring you this experiment that we're doing for this episode. It's going to be a three-part collaboration between myself and the Emergency Mind podcast, Dr. Andrea Austin and the Revitalizing Doctor podcast, and Dr. Cheryl Martin and the Mindful Medic podcast. We're going to start the conversation with part one here on the Emergency Mind podcast, move to part two with the Mindful Medic podcast, and then finish with part three on the Revitalizing Doctor podcast. I'm going to explain a little bit more. The whole conversation is going to be about recovery in general, and I think it's going to be just absolutely awesome. I really hope you enjoy. Before we get started, a reminder, if you haven't already, to check out our book, The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure. You can find it on Amazon or wherever books are sold, and if you already have a copy, I'd love to hear what you think about it. In fact, in general, I'd love to hear what you're thinking about, about performance under pressure. And you can reach me at dan at emergencymind.com. Okay, all that said, let's jump into part one of this episode on recovery. I hope you enjoy. All right, folks, welcome to this like really cool multi-part, multi-podcast mashup uh, where... Cheryl Martin, Andrea Austin, and I are going to come together and talk about an incredibly important, kind of challenging, and much needed topic, which is which is recovery. Um, so we're going to do this as a three part series. We're going to start talking about micro recovery, which is sort of the on shift moment to moment recovery. We're going to move into the medium field, the idea of meso recovery, uh, which is going to be recovery over the series of sort of the time frame of hours to days. And then we're going to end by talking about a really interesting and important concept of macro recovery, which is how do we really step back and recharge our batteries in a way that's so absolutely necessary. Um, so Cheryl, Andrea, like so happy to sit down with you all. So great to see you. And I don't know, it feels weird to welcome you to what is essentially also your own podcast, but welcome to this and and hi. This is like a podcast dream come true. My two favorite <laughs> podcasters and we're we're all together. Well, almost all together. We're Cheryl and I are actually sitting in the same room in San Diego. Uh, so we're so excited to have Cheryl here in person. Yeah, it, it does feel a bit surreal to be sitting next to this woman. Um, and it, it is thanks to you, Dan, that, you know, we know each other. Um, I, you know, thank you. Um, it's, you know, it's, I think it's after all these in-person, sorry, lack of in-person meetings to be able to do this in real time is really, really special. Oh, it's awesome. And, and one of the joys of sort of the broader community working on these critical issues is is all of the wonderful people that you meet and the other folks that are out there trying their best to make things happen here. So I'm I'm thrilled to be able to sit down with you all. Um, let, let's jump right in for, I think there's so much cool stuff to talk about here. And we're going to start on sort of the micro level, which is like recovery on shift. And, and I think for this first chunk, I really want to focus us on how do we recover from ultra intense moments how do we bring our team back to center and how do we prepare for what comes next? Um, so I guess, uh, I don't know, arbitrarily, Andrea, let's, let's jump in with you. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you set yourself up to recover after a really intense event and, and let's put a case on the table. So we're all sort of using the same language. So, um, Let's say you have uh, a kid that comes in and let's make it a pediatric asthma attack. So this is a six-year-old girl who has a history of asthma who comes in nearly an extremis and you have to intubate this person and oh, it is such a challenging intubation and you almost don't get it and the kid is pericode and you just sort of skim the surface of the ground and you're walking out of the room afterwards. So let's drop into that moment. What do you... What are you feeling in there? What are you doing to get yourself back to center in that moment? I think the first thing that I do now, not what I did early on in my career, is to acknowledge that something very significant happened and that I need to take a micro break. Earlier on in my career, I think there was such bravado around that this is what we do. And you can just jump back in. And I also think that was a protective mechanism to not really deal with what was happening, that I can just jump in and see another patient uh, because that's what we do. But that's never my approach anymore. And I usually acknowledge I need the break. And then can I communicate to somebody that I'm stepping off the floor for a minute is 
hopefully I'm not in a single coverage area that I can, and even in that moment, if I am in a single coverage area, I will find a charge nurse, a lead nurse and say, I need a few minutes. And what, what logistically, like, what does that look like for you when you say you acknowledge that a challenging thing just happened? Is that you taking a second and taking a deep breath silently? Is that you saying out loud, that was hard? What, what does that actually look like? Yeah, I think it depends. If the team is still there, then I'm usually verbalizing out loud that that was really challenging. And I may be letting them know that I'd like to debrief that case and maybe quickly trying to figure out, are we going to do that right now? Or let's try to meet back here in 15 minutes. But I, I tend to be a talker. So I'm probably verbalizing out loud to somebody that it was hard. Um, there are those cases, though, where everyone scatters very quickly and you are left by yourself. In those times, I'm usually, if I'm by myself, I'm, I'm quiet and I'm trying to find a way to uh, step off the floor if it was something really significant. Cheryl, what about you? What are your what are your moves in those first couple moments after after a case you've just intubated this child? It was a serious challenge, and you're you're stepping out to to regroup. Yeah, I, I would echo much of what Andrea has said there. Um, I think historically, I probably have also been guilty of going on to the next thing. Um, I do. I sometimes think that there isn't that opportunity for that space and we actually need to actively carve it out because there is always, a, there's actually always an opportunity to take it, but we don't, we maybe haven't, oh, I certainly haven't acknowledged myself in the past that if I don't take this time now, I'm actually going to store myself up for problems later on. Um, and time spent wisely now, even if it's brief, um, will actually pay dividends, um, not just later on in that shift, but from shift to shift. And we're going to go on to talk about that because you know, these are moments of, uh, I suppose you can call them those uh, micro traumas. And I, I agree, we have a you stop for five debrief, um, got my little tag on, and it might be a good opportunity to bring the team together. I also do like to talk through things, um, but sometimes will need my own space. Um, and again, I think it will depend on the scenario and it will depend what the, the kind of state of the climate. And I hope that we'll go on to talk about the fact that if you are in a situation or a particular shift where you have no option but to go to the next crisis, then where are you going to make that space and time for recovery if it's not now? Maybe I'll flip that to both of you. Yeah, you, you mean how do we how do we process how do we start to make this micro recovery if there's like other patients waiting and other things you know going on demanding our attention? Yeah, Dan. So you've just stepped out of that mm -hmm. um, pilot charge resuscitation, and um, your senior nurse and a resus has just grabbed you and said, "We need you. We've got a trauma coming in and resus one now." Yeah, I think this is a really you know important piece of this. Um, this happened to me two or three times in the last week uh, in our resuscitation area. We had, you know, multiple traumas coming in stacked, and there really wasn't the space to do the normal sort of regroup moves after each one because you literally have to jump from one to the next one. But I think an important piece of that is that um, it doesn't mean you don't have to do it. It just means you can't do it in that second, mm. right? Like even at the micro scale, you need to acknowledge what happened. You need to process it. You need to uh, study it. You need to sort of, it's not that you're looking for catharsis, right? Because you don't need catharsis to be okay, but you need to acknowledge what happened and, and start to work with it. Sometimes you cannot do it in that exact second. So you got to kind of make a mental note that you're going to come back to it. Right. And, and often if I'm with a team, I'll say that I'll say, okay, folks, we got to move to room three right now. A lot just happened in this room. We will talk about it. We're going to talk about it after we settle this next patient. All right. So let's come back together. Let's plan on that. And then you sort of move to the next thing. And even that little bit of an acknowledgement of it, I think makes a difference. 
similarly, I, I think if a patient dies, then even having a moment of silence, even if it's just literally one second of silence that you can regroup and and honor that person that was there, uh, I think is a really big piece of it. Just on that, so there's two different scenarios there. That the, the going back to the first scenario where things have actually gone well, despite it being quite fraught, and you've then gone into the next case. Um, if it hadn't gone well, mm-hmm. would that change your approach to then just charging on if there was an option to call in another senior colleague, for example? Oh, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think um, you, you get you get to a really good point there, which is that sometimes there's a false... Uh, I don't know, maybe the word I'm looking for is false duality, right? Like we think we're stuck in the situation where we have to move to the next thing. And maybe that's not true, right? Maybe that's just us being tunnel vision. And maybe what we can do is bring in a second team or scramble a second team to come pick up the next thing coming in. Um, and I'll definitely do that, right? If we have multiple incoming at the same time and I have the ability, I'll scramble a second team, even if they then dissipate and we don't need them for something. Um, so looking for alternative solutions where you give your team a chance to reboot before you cycle back up again, I think is really is really clutch. I would like to say that my recovery is identical regardless of the outcome of the case before that. But that's probably not actually true, right? Probably I I need and have a different set of things to process coming out of a case where there was a, a challenging outcome, a bad outcome versus a good outcome. Certainly that's true for performance, right? If I look at my performance, if my performance, the part that's under my control was not what I want it to be, I'll probably need a little bit more time or I'll want more time to regroup than if my performance was excellent. And that's probably true for outcome too. Yeah, you literally just read my mind, Dan. I was thinking, and I can definitely recall some scenarios in which I did not handle myself um, to the level I really expect. And coming out of those rooms is very hard. Um, And trying to, you know, grapple with um, guilt and shame and regret about something that you did. Um, It happens, I think, less often now than maybe earlier on in my career. Um, But man, when it happens now, it's, it's particularly jarring. Um, it, it's hard in a different way. It was hard when you were a resident because you know it, it happens more often that you maybe miss an airway or need assistance in, in your you know grappling with that. Uh, but now as an attending um, that's been doing it for a while, when something doesn't go right, it's it's pretty it's pretty hard. And so that's for me the moment that it's super important to create some quiet space for me to step off the floor and really get my mind right. Uh, Even if it's only one or two minutes that, you know, I've got to get it together um, and make it through the rest of the shift and, you know, figure out, like you're saying, make that mental note of, I have to come back to this, but um, I can't get all the way down into this hole right now. Um, I do have to go back in. Yeah. And I think this is going to be a thing that's going to link this uh, multi-part episode together is the flow of of different parts of recovery and the way that we use the small moments to set ourselves up for the larger, deeper moments of recovery, whether that's flagging something for studying later or sort of allowing ourselves to have the space to acknowledge something, even if we can't fully dig into it. Can I ask you both, because this is something I know myself and my colleagues are struggling with, so maybe take us away from that resus scenario to the main floor, main department, you're in charge, you maybe have you know 10 juniors on shift, a couple have just started in the department, um, a few are still new to emergency medicine, and uh, You have probably every three minutes um, somebody coming to you with a new patient to discuss, um, 
multiple competing demands. And I think we're seeing, you know, this has always been the case with being in charge um, when you get to specialist level. But I think just given volume um, and you know the, the current climate of our emergency departments, I see cognitive fatigue and overwhelm that that point is being it, it's regular to reach that um, in an average shift. This is not the exception. It, it's just what is happening. So I think that's the thing that we're mainly struggling with. Where do you, so how do you, you actually have to actively seek out, I think, these moments then in the middle of this fibre shift. What do you do there in that kind of um, climate? Yeah, um, for real. <laughs> Uh, I, I think being conscious of that is a first step, knowing that uh, burning constantly from all ends of the candle is not the right necessarily way to do it, right? And instead that what you need to do is find and build out moments of recovery in between cases, even in the middle of cases or wherever you can, right? So I, I um, teach my teams to look for moments of calm in the middle of a storm. Right, and so one one piece of that is to be on the lookout for when there is likely to be a break in the action. Right, so I, I know you said to get away from resuscitation, but I'm going to go back to resuscitation for a minute for this point, which is often um, you know somebody comes in and they're really sick, and your whole team is activated, and you're swarming around them, and everything's going, and then after a few minutes, you know there's a break in the action when the X-ray comes in the room to take a chest X-ray. And everybody files out for a second. And that's a, that's a natural built pause in the flow of the resuscitation, right? Unless that person is literally dying that second, everyone is out of the room. Nobody's hands are doing anything. And there's a brief moment where you can take a breath, check your pulse, change the way you're standing, and sort of remind yourself to, to slow down for a second. Now, those things will pass unnoticed unless you're looking for them, Right. I mean, the first couple of times that I did a, a trauma resuscitation like that, that moment looks like it just blinked by and didn't even exist, right? But now that I'm a little better at it, I can look for those moments where things slow down and take advantage of them. And so I, I, oft, I train my juniors to really be on the lookout for those those in like inbuilt periods of calm like that. Um, if you can't build them, or sorry, if you can't find them, then sometimes you can go out and build them, right? So in answer to your question about if everybody's coming at me all at once, right? Sometimes it's easy to say, um, okay, is that person you're about to tell me about, are you worried about them? Are they dying? No. Okay. Then I'm going to need you to come back in two minutes. I'm going to create a bubble where only the most critical things can get through and if there's nothing critical, phenomenal. I'm going to sit in that bubble for a second and I'm going to take a breath. Um, a recent podcast guest of mine, uh, Rachel Vickery, who's a total expert at all sorts of things, amazing around recovery and, and rebuilding and breath and everything, makes the point that um, in that moment, one thing we could choose to do is to look uh, at a horizon line, right? We know physiologically we are wired to activate our parasympathetic system and calm down if we're able to see an empty horizon that is free of threat, right? That gives us theoretical time between the predator and us. So if you can look at a horizon, if you can walk out of the place into the ambulance bay and see a horizon, um, or in, in, and I thought this was kind of brilliant in, in her words, if you can't find that, can you look up at the ceiling where the wall meets the ceiling? Cause there's sort of a horizon up there right? And find something that is a horizontal line, look at it and take a couple breaths and really train yourself to slow back down and activate your parasympathetic system. But, but to me, the, the deeper or underlying skill set is look for moments of calm and leverage them. And if you can't find them naturally, then learn how to build them. I don't know, Andrea, what do you think? I was thinking about how we can reframe what a micro recovery actually is. I mean, we've been focusing a lot on maybe being quiet, where sometimes a micro recovery, especially if you like to talk, is chatting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, simply before that medical student or resident goes into their presentation, if you don't know them very well, tell me where you're from. What do you like to do for fun? And even just a couple, you know, 90 seconds of that is a mental break. And we respond to those expressions. Uh, it's hard with the masks still, but you can see people's eyes 
move and and react. Or sometimes if I'm really feeling like I've been sitting in my chair a lot and I'm tired of looking at the computer screen, I'll say, let's go for a walk and talk about that patient or let's go refill our coffee together. Yeah, that's perfect. While, while we're doing that. And but but if we can train ourselves that that's a recovery, because I think sometimes we do those things automatically, but we don't really tell ourselves that this is a little break that I'm taking. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's lovely. And you've just made me think I was having a conversation with a colleague. And, you know, I think many of us are coming to shift feeling the how unsafe our departments can be at times of surge um, at the moment. And having to have that helicopter view as the in charge, you're not necessarily getting to do you know, some of the things in your your practice that bring you joy. And she describes this beautiful, just taking 10 minutes uh, to go in and see a patient herself. It was something that, you know, she could pick it right away as a specialist. Um, she had a beautiful interaction with her pediatric patient and the family. And that was restorative. That was micro recovery for her. And, you know, she then had to come back out into the the storm, but that regenerated her. It filled her up a bit to carry on um, being in charge. Yeah, I think part of that is is a uh, consciousness and a language issue around that, right? Like, can we, if we if we're looking for moments of peace in a chaotic situation where we can do recovery, where we can do micro recoveries, part of our job on that is saying that we're looking for that. Part of our job is making that explicit to our team around us, uh, and saying, "All right, hey, we're like in this next resuscitation, or we're going to look for a moment where we can regroup. We're just going to be on the lookout for it, even if we don't find it, even if we don't pick it up. We're going to be on the lookout for it, uh, and it might look like this, it might not. We'll see what it looks like, right? And and making that come to the forefront of mind as a skill that we're going to work on, just like we're going to work on our team communication, we're going to work on our positioning as we, you know." access the right and left sides of the patient and all the stuff like that. I think what's really fascinating about this conversation and why I'm so glad we're having it is this is antithetical to current culture of medicine. Hmm. And I'm thinking back to when I was a resident, there was a super busy community ED that we rotated in and the place like was always just like, just nuts. And I also had cognitive overload because it's not my usual hospital, right? So I had picked up a bunch of patients, trying to figure out how to navigate the EMR. And I, I just paused for a minute at the computer and I, I probably was taking a deep breath, but I wasn't doing anything. I was not in motion. And the attending looked at me and he said, you have to constantly be moving. You're either seeing a patient or you're writing a note or you're, but you, you can't hold still. He's like, don't ever do that in front of me again. Wow. That sounds like that person had a lot of stress to work out. He had a lot of stress. But when you look at some of our colleagues, I do see that, that there, I, we, we had a resident that we jokingly called, it was one of my co-residents, Hummingbird, that, mm. that, that was also very prized in, in my residency that that you didn't eat on shift and that you put it all out, all out on the line for that eight hour shift. And I think this is still, I mean, we're among like minds right now. This is still a cultural issue that it is not sustainable to have humans working under that level of stress for that many hours. For this many years, and we're seeing the result of it. We're seeing so many doctors now, doctors leaving the profession. So we have to start normalizing these micro recoveries. You know, I, I, I want to I want to push one step. I want to add one step to that, which is that not only is it not good to burn constantly without micro recovery, but I actually think we will be better if we instead follow a syncopated rhythm like that where we're acting, we're recovering, we're acting, we're recovering. Uh, and that is not a source of weakness. That's not, we're not capable of burning for eight hours. That's, we're trying to do the best possible. We're trying to be elite performers and elite performers balance action and recovery across every field that I've had a chance to study and every field that I've even remotely connected to. 
right? You balance performance and recovery and you balance it on multiple time frames, and you balance it on multiple scales. Um, and I, I'm sometimes guilty of referring to all of us as sharks, right? Like we keep, we keep moving, but even sharks and, oh man, I don't know, this may be true. I'm going to say this, this is a fact I think I know, but I'm not really sure. Even sharks turn off parts of their brain at certain times, right? In order to, to swim and recover at the same time. I hope that's true. Otherwise I'm sounding super weird about that, but. I think you're right. They must, right? right? I mean, yeah. every being eventually has to slow down. So, yeah, I mean, I think we're finally seeing the chickens coming home to roost that we have pushed at such a breakneck pace. And with the stress of COVID on top of it, uh, this is not sustainable anymore. Yeah. I like the idea of how can you actually sync this to something else you're doing? What are the, what are the cues through your shift? Because it's yeah, very perfect. Easy. You, I mean, I actually, coming out of that first scenario that you described, I will fully admit I might have left that in quite a state of flow, ready to charge into the next. And and I get, you know, that that's my high performance. That's where I actually can get into the zone. That's what we trained for. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's one side of the coin. But we have, you know, we've had, to, we've done a lot of work in our department around this. And it's by far from perfect yet. But realizing, you know, leadership or kind of consultants weren't role modeling, actually taking meal breaks, but then using COVID as a driver because we've we've had COVID as a, you know, in crisis, we actually we can allow us to pivot and make things happen in ways that that weren't possible before. So, you know, hydration has been a problem with masks and PPE. What about we, you know, we just say every two hours, you know, we need to be taking a five minute um, drink break. Here's, here's the hydration stations. Did you know that you, you should be having a 15 minute break in, you know, four hours? That That's kind of w- what you're entitled to. You've got another half hour break, a 15 minute break. Let's normalize this. Let's have a discussion at the morning at our huddle. We're going to take breaks. Obviously, we need to be a bit inherently flexible. This is an emergency department, but maybe that's an opportunity to get better at handovers with each other. You know, these are high risk points for patient safety. So let's, you know, tag that on. And you know, we've got a tick box where we come in and have you done, you know, if you signed in to MedTask or EHR, have you taken your break? Can we just add that as another mm-hmm. little button, you know, just to so that I can check and we're going to keep each other accountable? I'm in charge here. If you know, I used to, and I think I've said this to you before, I wouldn't go till my juniors went and I get seriously hangry. That is not good for me. Um, and you know, I not good for anybody else. So how can we use different points through the day um or hand over peers to make these things happen? Hydration, you know, basic performance, um, essentials. These are fundamental. Why is it so hard? And um, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> no, that that's awesome. And 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 in just a second, we're going to transition to like our next scale of conversation about this. But I, I want to finish with this thought, which is what you just said, which is what are, as an open question for all of us, what are some of the cues that we can use during the course of our shift or during the flow of a case to remind ourselves to also seek recovery and to do these spaces of micro recovery in between cases and on shift? What are the cues we can use? W- one of them we talked about is, you know, uh, x-ray entering the room and everybody leaving. That's a, that's a one I tend to go off of, but what else? Yeah, it's interesting because you're looking at cueing from like the environment. How can we be cued in where my mind went to, how do I know my cues? Mm. Well, my cues are, you know, muscle tension, my neck's hurting, my shoulders hurting. I find myself um, being annoyed or, you know, being more curt in my responses it's it's definitely time for a micro break but i like that idea of the x-ray break in trauma is Mm -hmm. such a such a great one i'm trying to think of what other little yeah it's sort of like using the built environment around us using the structure to nudge us into taking these breaks right cuz sometimes you forget sometimes you're too hyped up sometimes you're too amped up to to rely at least I am to rely totally on my own sense of introspection of how my how my stress level is going how my cognitive load thing is going um you know i mean you could you could envision you know there's all this sophisticated biotech out there that 
like measures your pupil size and calculates your cognitive load. So, I mean, maybe it like dings an alarm if your cognitive load has been above a certain thing for so long, like, Hey, you got to take a breath. You know that, I mean, that'd be amazing. I, I currently don't have access to that, but are there other environmental cues we can use to nudge us to do the right thing? We were just looking, so I now have one of these iWatches. I had a GPS for running before, but this thing, I actually got it to bond with my dad because uh, he can send me his ECG from the UK. That's just by the by on his iWatch and I can see when he goes for his weekly run. But um, this thing actually will see, stop, take a pause, take three deep breaths when I am, when my heart rate goes up through my shift. Hmm. Um, And maybe I should be paying more attention to it, but there's some external cues. I probably should harness it. I just thought of another, you know, patient scenario in which it's it's good to a pause is kind of built in, usually after intubation. I mean, unless something is, you know, going completely wrong and the patient's crumping post intubation, there's usually kind of like, ooh, all right, we got that done. And, you know, if you planned ahead and had all your drips ready to go before you hopefully mm-hmm. did intubate it, there is kind of usually a natural lull after that. And the other one I, I really try to build in now is a pre-pause, a pre-before I'm going in to do a procedure. And most of my nurses know now that, that I'm going to run and go to the bathroom mm-hmm. or I want to just like have this little pause um, and make sure my, you know, if I'm going in for a central line that I take my jacket off and I'm not going to be too hot underneath the um, the surgical gown, just little things that I make sure I'm more comfortable in optimizing before that procedure. And I think of that as a recovery that I'm taking care of myself before I take care of this other person. Yeah, we, we totally, you know, we always talk about in the Emergency Mind Project, like prepare, perform, recover, and evolve. And mm-hmm. preparation and recovery go hand in hand so much for that, right? In both cases, we're really supporting ourselves as we're, as we're doing our work. And I, I'm getting more and more into the idea of uh, setting intelligent to faults in the systems around us to make success the default outcome, right? And so some of that is like doing what we're saying here, setting yourself up for success before you do a thing, recovering from a thing, consciously leveraging the existing differences in flow through your department to, to really capitalize on that and take breaks for yourself. Um, and man, I, I keep coming back to the x-ray folks, right? Like you know, after that intubation, you have that pause and then x-ray comes in yet again, a reminder to get out of the room, walk away from the patient and like, take your break right there. So I, I, I didn't realize how, like, thank you. Any, uh, radiology technician folks who are listening to this for helping me recover in the way that I need to. I know we're just about ready to wrap this segment, but I just thought of another little micro recovery technique is gratitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you know, oftentimes during that stressful situation of the intubation, you know, really looking your RT in the eye and saying, thank you. I, I really appreciated your help with that. Um, that to me is also a micro recovery and you're contributing to that other person's recovery that you paused long enough to say something very simple. Love it. All right, folks, that closes out the first part on micro recovery. From here, we're going to head over to the Mindful Medic podcast with Cheryl Martin to talk about the meso scale of recovery. You can find the Mindful Medic podcast basically anywhere that you can find a podcast. Uh, just remember that it's mindful with two L's, like a full mind. So the Mindful Medic podcast with Cheryl Martin. As always on this podcast, our goal is to dive deep into what it takes to perform under pressure. Nothing that we discuss here should be construed as medical advice, and all of the opinions that we discuss are our own and are not necessarily representative of any organization with which we were affiliated or for whom we work. If you want to go even deeper and get more involved, don't forget to check out our book. It's called The Emergency Mind, Wiring Your Brain for Performance Under Pressure, and you can find it at emergencymind.com book. All right, good luck out there.